Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so again, I'm Thomas Varga. I am basically going to be talking about, the thing that I like talking the most about when I come to classrooms like this is, you know, we're, we're all studying Shakespeare often from like an ap academic point of view, looking at reading the text and, and dis discussing the text from a reading point of view. Um, for me as an actor, when I'm reading the text, I'm looking for maybe some different things than you might be looking for if you're looking to write an essay or you're looking to uh, analyze the text from a literary point of view. I'm looking for certain things about finding out how I can get myself into the character, how I can make choices about how I'm going to deliver the text, what I want, what my motivations are as the character, uh, physical choices, vocal choices, things like that. So that's what I'm looking for while I'm reading the text. I'm doing a lot of the same things you're doing anyway. I'm looking at themes. I'm looking at um, the, the, the way the story is written, but I'm also, the, the, the focus is a little bit different. I'm looking at how I can create the character. So what I'm going to be doing today a little bit is talking about my process in creating Puck when I played, played Puck here, um, oh, the picture that was just there, uh, at the New Swan Shakespeare Festival here at UCI, and kind of how I came to some of these choices and also kind of bringing in some of the performances of different p parts of the text as I kind of go through this. So a really, really important part of figuring out how to get into the character, or getting into a, a, a play or a, any kind of acting situation is knowing what is the central conflict. What, are, what is conflict we think of in normal life as something that might be bad. But as an actor, you're looking for friction. Things that are dramatic or comedic or, or what makes us want to watch something is that there's some kind of conflict. One person wants something or one group wants something and another group wants something else and there's friction. There's conflict in between those two things. So that's one of the first things I look for. So we have to figure out what is the conflict, especially from my point of view, from Puck's point of view in the play. What is the main point of conflict in Midsummer Night's Dream? And I think we get a lot of key from that. We know, at least with the fairies, that there's this, this argument going on between Titania and Oberon, these, the king and queen of the forest, the fairies. So we get a lot of that information from Puck. So I'm kind of going to start with, with one performance piece where our first introduction to Puck, we see one of the fairies come out, the first fairy, and sort of, uh, in our production at least, sing this song and talk about how the Queen Titania is going to be coming to this part of the forest. Puck overhears this and pops out of the forest and responds with, The King doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed the Queen come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fell and wrath because that she, as her attendant, hath a lovely child stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling. And jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train, to trace the forest wild. But she, perforce, withholds the loved one, crowns it with flowers, and swears to share with none. And now they never meet in grove or green, by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. But they do swear that all their elves, for fear, creep into acorn cups and hide them there. <laughs> so that's our first little thank you. First little bit, we get some information here. So one thing to think about, one big difference between Shakespeare and other types of acting is that the audience exists for the characters. We're speaking sometimes to people. I am refer I'm responding to the fairy. But I'm also speaking to you. The, the audience exists. So there's a lot of, in, in that speech, there is a lot of exposition. Me talking about what's going on in the past. You didn't see this. Let me catch you up to speed. I don't have, it, sometimes it's difficult to do in a, in a realistic context because you have to figure out, well, why, why am I explaining this to this person who already knows? Well, there's a bunch of people who don't already know this. So it's also, you can, you can bring that in as the character. I'm going to let you guys know what's going on, catch you guys up to speed so you know what's going on between us. We get some information about this, uh, the conflict between Oberon and Titania, what's going on in the forest. For a lot of it, we, we, we if we're just reading it, we, it's easy to forget that there's this changeling child because there's nothing st stated in the play that that character even is seen on stage. It's referenced in our production. We decided to bring the changeling child into the play. There was an actress playing that part. So that added a lot of interest to, to me in having that, that speech talking about, oh, this conflict is about this child that they have. And what do, what do I say about it? I say that Oberon wants to have the child be the knight of his train to trace the forest wild, kind of be a soldier, maybe, maybe have a little bit more of a masculine energy. While Titania wants to crown it with flowers and, 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 and have a totally different way of, of raising this child. So it kind of made me start to think, okay, maybe this is a, a, a parental 
fight, a fight about how they're raising this changeling child. It also started to make me real, uh, question, well, what is a changeling? What, is this, what does this have to do with, with the rest of the play? Sometimes you get answers from the text. Sometimes you get answers from how the production is handling this particular play. So our director, Eli Simon, had what made first the choice to have the changeling in the play. And second, if you saw the costume I was wearing, the white wig with the mohawk and all of that, the changeling child was costumed exactly the same way as me. So that was something like, huh, this is strange. Why are there two pucks? What does this mean? This started to make me think about, well, who is Puck? Where does Puck come from? I will, I will give another speech, and I'll talk a little bit more about where Puck may come from. So the, the first fairy, this is right after this one speech. The first fairy says, are you, are you this guy, Puck, that comes around and tricks people and does, does all these kind of mischievous things? And Puck responds, thou speaks to right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile when I, a fat and bean-fed horse, beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal. Woo! <laughs> the wisest aunt, telling the saddest tale, some time for three-foot stool mistaketh me. Then slip I from her bum, down topples she, whoosh, and Taylor cries and falls into a cough. And then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh and waxing in their mirth will sneeze and swear <laughs> a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. Cool. So this gives a little bit more about he's a trickster. He's connected to Oberon. He's picked, he's sided with Oberon, whereas the other fairy, and seemingly all the rest of the fairies, sided with Titania. So I got to figure out why does he pick Oberon's team and who, what kind of character is he? So I started doing other research and found some poetry and some stories from around the same time about Puck or Robin Goodfellow that explained a lot more about his background. Now, this is an actor's choice, doesn't come up in the actual play, but is similar in time and, and refers to where he's coming from. I'm going to use that if it helps me. The cool part about being an actor is the stuff that's not stated for sure, if you make choices or you come up with something, you can add to it because you want to fill in the gaps that you don't have from the play. So this, some of this background talked about how Puck was a half fairy. Puck was um, kind of the product of an affair between Oberon and a human, and he grew up as a human, didn't know that he was a fairy, but started realizing he could do magical things, transform himself into different shapes and animals. So he would use this to play tricks on people. He eventually got a letter from his dad, Oberon, that said he was a fairy and he went to join the fairies in the forest. So this gives me another context to, okay, this helps me answer the questions. Why did I pick Oberon's team? Well, he's my dad and I'm not related to Titania. That kind of gives that element to it. It also it, it, it gives a little bit more um, interesting choices to how I interact with Oberon. Because if I'm just thinking about, I'm his lackey, I do what he says, that's a little bit, I don't know, it's, it's not as interesting to me as, well, what if I am his son who may or may not like the orders I'm supposed to, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really necessarily agree with what I'm supposed to do or want to change it up in that kind of, I'm going to do a different dad. So I might, that can influence why I'm making the choices that I make. Um, which then lead me to, led me to the next question, that everywhere I've ever read about Midsummer Night's Dream, before I'd ever worked on it, Puck is described, and even in the play, described as a mischievous trickster. Somebody who's uh, playing with people and making these tricks and he's, he's mischievous. But as I read the play and I just, just read the text of what am I doing in the play, Everything Puck does is executing an order. Everything he does was, Oberon says, do this. Okay, does it. Doesn't seem very mischievous to me. Kind of feels like a rule follower. So it was a big deal to me to figure out, well, but it also says that he is a mischievous. So how, what can I do? How can I pull things out of the play that are able to bring in that mischievous nature? Um, so what are the, the two main tricks that Puck plays in the, in the play are he, he interacts with, the, the lovers. He ends up screwing up the lovers by making the wrong person fall in love, and he transforms Bottom into a, into a donkey. So, with the first one, he has, he's given, uh, where did I put that? He's given a flower, which I found on the way here. Um, 
that has magical powers, that when he puts the magical charms from the flower into, into a person's eyes, they wake up, fall in love with the first person, the first person that they see. So he's told by Oberon, kind of incidentally, hey, there's some lovers in the forest. One of them doesn't love the other one. Why don't you go fix that? So Puck is wandering through the forest and has been wandering for quite a while. He can go pretty fast, so I'm assuming he's really looked everywhere. And he says, through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none on whose eyes I might affirm this flower's force in stirring love. Night and silence. Who's here? Weeds of Athens he do wear. And here, another sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Churl, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this force doth owe. So then, he leaves, or no, in the, in the play it seems like he may leave from there. But one of the choices we made, not textually based, is that, or, or there's, no, there's no stage direction that says he stays. But if he just makes you wake up, fall in love with the wrong person, leaves, doesn't even know it happened, that doesn't seem very mischievous. That seems like, oh, he made an accident. He's, he's if he doesn't know, if he doesn't know that he created a problem, then Puck is just seen as a rule follower and a screw up. <laughs> Somebody that's not doing, I, I wanted to so find this side of him that intentionally was gleeful about making uh, pandemonium. So what we found is, oh, instead of adding anything or changing anything, what if, because right after this happens, and he says, when, uh, you know, now awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Seems like that's an exit line, which normally would be the case. But then the other lovers come in immediately. So what happens if they come in before I'm able to leave? I must now to Oberon. Leave, uh-oh, they're coming in. We had a device where I had this fern leaves that made me invisible. So if I'm holding it, I'm invisible. Uh-oh, people are coming in, I don't have time to escape, leaves. So I'm invisible on stage. So at this point, now I get to stay on stage and see everybody wake up, all the stuff happen, and then they leave. Now I know, and I have the choice to go and try and fix it, because that's not what I was supposed to do. But then I made the choice to then, everybody leaves, I see how prob problematic it now is, and I respond with, <laughs> and leave. So that, I think, was a big way of, of, as an actor, trying to solve the problem of marrying the stuff that we hear about Puck as being a mischievous trickster who's powerful and can do, do stuff and is in charge of it versus what we see him actually do as just executing um, what he's told to do and, um, and failing. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a, a way that I could kind of try to inject that. His other trick. Uh, is turning bottom into a donkey. So we get to see that happen, but then as we come back from intermission, he gets to tell Oberon. So this is an example of, it's a little bit of the device of, of Shakespeare letting us be caught up on what happened if you missed it from Puck, but also I have a real reason to be saying it because Oberon doesn't know what I've done. Oberon told me that uh, he wants Titania as a trick on her to wake up and fall in love with some wild beast. I happen to then see some, uh, some townsfolk, some workers who are rehearsing a play in the forest, and I decide to marry those two goals. Play a trick on them and do what I'm supposed to do for dad. So here's me explaining that to, to Oberon. So Oberon comes on stage, asks, you know, what, what's been going on in this, in this haunted grove? And I respond with, my mistress with a monster is in love near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour. A crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play, intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break, when I did him at this advantage take, and as his knoll, I fix it on his head. Anon, his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. So, at his sight, away his fellows fly, and at our stamp, here o'er and o'er one falls, he murder cries, and help from Athens calls. I led them on in this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. When, in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania awaked, and straightway loved an ass.
So that's, that's fun because he's getting to relive what he did and you get to see his excitement and joy about it. Again here, yes, he's doing what Oberon told him to do, but he's also creatively mixing, seeing these people he think are, thinks are ridiculous, playing a trick on them, and doing what he's supposed to do. So that starts to tell me, okay, so he's maybe not evil. He likes to play within the rules. So that started to influence small choices, little ways of delivering some of these lines that he is a trickster, but also is a rule follower and likes to play in those boundaries. So that started to give me a really good idea of who he might be, the, his personality. That he's, he's, he's not evil, but he's not, yes sir, I'll do the best I can. If he can play and do something within it that, that gives him joy at making people a little bit uncomfortable, he's going to do that. Um, so that brings us to the end of the play, where um, often in Shakespeare plays they end with these sorts of epilogues, where one of the characters comes out and basically begs for applause. Um, something interesting about the way Puck talks about it is, you know, maybe you didn't like this play. Maybe it was too confusing, too complicated, and it just wasn't your cup of tea. So that's kind of where the, the premise that he starts from, where everybody leaves, the play has finished, and he ends with, if we shadows have offended. Think but this and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these, these visions did appear and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. So, um, yeah, I think, I think with that, it's an interesting, that's another interesting place to find and play with actually engaging with the audience. It's a famous speech. It's strange to me why it's a famous speech, <laughs> a little bit, uh, because it is kind of an afterthought. It's an afterthought of the play where he's asking, um, you know, hey, please clap. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but still finding within that there's still play, there's, you can, based on all the other choices and, and things I was able to find by analyzing the text, trying to, f the questions that come up as you're looking at the script as to, well, why does he do that if this is the case? Those are the important questions to be asking as an actor and I think as a reader to figure out, well, why, why if this is there, why does this also exist? And how can you come up with something that, that merges those things to make them work together? Um, and I think all of that stuff really ends up and leads to that end speech is how you can come to this, this type of speech that is common in a Shakespeare play with a little bit of a different perspective, a little different attitude. Yeah, this maybe wasn't the best. But if you didn't like it, we can do it better next time. Please clap. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's sort of where I'll, I'll end with my performance uh, stuff. Yeah, and we can, we can show some, some, uh, some clips from the actual production. You can kind of see what the theater looks like. Um, and with, with some costume. So questions for Thomas? As an actor interpreting this role, I was really interested in the physical elements, which we taught. Yes, Ainsley. Like Puck has two names, Puck and Robin. Did that, like did you change things based on how he was presented? Because sometimes it was Puck, sometimes it was Robin. Yeah, um, so, so yeah, his name technically is Robin Goodfellow, like that's his name. Uh, Puck is sort of what he is, he is a Puck, and he's kind of been famously um, called Puck from, you know, kind of, kind of combined. So I, I think uh, in, 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 that was something that I had to kind of figure out at first, but, but um, I kind of, it sort of just sort of started to feel like it was merging for me, like it was almost like Puck's my nickname. You know, it's like if maybe if maybe if a character is referring to me as Robin, it's like you're being a little bit more formal. Or maybe it's you know the kind of feeling, especially if Oberon says it, that feeling of when you're using your full name, you know, <laughs> versus calling you know calling me Puck. Well, it was kind of interesting sometimes too. You know, we do the show many many times, and um, uh, I think to to speak specifically to how it made me feel, I kind of once we had kind of gotten on on um, on on the wagon about how it goes, I, I didn't 
prick my ear as much, but there were some, certain times where the actor playing Oberon uh, very rarely, but sometimes would accidentally call me the opposite. They'd say Rahid to Robin or Puck, and those times I would notice, like, huh, why are you calling me that now? So I think, I think thinking about, it, it's really like if you have a nickname, if you have something that people don't always call you, or if you go by, like I do, I go by my full name, if somebody calls me Tom, I'll still know it's me, but I'll like, huh, that's interesting, that's different. Um, and changes possibly the relationship or says something about the relationship that you might have to that other character. Good question. Uh, can you say something about the movement? We, one of my lectures was on movement and metamorphosis in the play. And I was trying, you know, trying to get students to read the play for movement cues and for movement ideas because we get so, as English, you know, in the English class yeah. and literature class, we get very focused on the words on the page. But as soon as we see you start acting, we see how important the movement element yeah. is. So movement's important. I, I tend to think about, especially Shakespeare, but all, all scripts really, as the architecture or like the, the blueprints of the performance. So it's just the things that are said. There's a whole bunch else that you need to do in terms of what words you're emphasizing, how, you know, pitch variation, where you're directing certain lines, how you're using your body. And I think part of it is, is to help with meaning. I think part of what I'm thinking about with movement is the same with whatever character I'm playing, is figuring out how can I, how can I clarify this by inhabiting the language that I'm, that I'm speaking. So for example, I mean, it can be as simple as, you know, when I'm saying they do square, like I'm not, I'm not, you're probably not going to know if I'm just, they do square. You're probably not going to think about what that means versus if I kind of take on a little bit of a physical cue of what I'm talking about, kind of inhabiting the, the ideas so that I'm, so it's, 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 it's affecting how I'm speaking it, how I'm thinking about it, and I'm living through the ideas that I'm speaking, but it's also helping clarify sections, especially sections that might not be as readily uh, understandable to a modern audience just watching. So I'm always trying to figure out how I can be energized and interested myself as I'm going through the text, as well as helping uh, make some of those, those sections of the text more accessible or more understandable. Um, the other element is thinking about, well, what kind of, especially with a character like Puck, or in the previous season I played Caliban, who was a lot more you know, down here and kind of creeping and, and, and to the floor, physical, like kind of earthy, um, thinking about how they might move um, and letting that affect me. So like Puck is, you know, described as, as mischievous, as like, as a fairy, which is kind of more, you know, light and airy. So I might be a little bit more light on my feet, a little quicker up, as opposed to being down and kind of visceral and gritty. Um, that also comes into voice. To, in terms of where I'm placing my voice as I speak. Um, if I have, you know, if I'm, you know, cat, more down in this kind of place, I might, a character, you know, um, like Caliban might, might be uh, using a different part of, part of my vocal range versus Puck might be my, more up here and more sing-songy. The other element is taking cues from how the, the text is written. Most of, almost all, if not all, of Midsummer Night's Dream is rhyming couplets. Almost everything I say is rhyming couplets. So it has this sing-songy feel to it. So how can I kind of have a little bit of a sing-songy thing and rhyme when I need to rhyme? Also goes on to something I meant to mention about rhyme. I think rhyme is so important and the characters are intentionally rhyming. I don't think it's like, oops, I just happened to be rhyming. I think making the choice to let the character know that they're rhyming, and especially in places where the language in our current pronunciation of words maybe don't rhyme, coming up with an acting reason why you might. So for example, when Oberon, when I'm completing the rhyme for Oberon, which I always think is a fun thing, when a character is picking up somebody else's last line and rhyming with it when at the, at the uh, towards the middle of the play, when Oberon says, you know, what, what's going on in this haunted grove? Puck picks up the line, my mistress or the monster is in love. So I decided I'd like to keep the rhyme if I can. So what if I make an acting choice to make him say love, like he's, so I can get the rhyme to happen, but I'm also play, making fun of love and kind of being like saucy with that line. So I'm getting an acting reason, but I'm also completing the rhyme in a way that you can still hear it. And it's still clear that, that Puck is, oh, I hear you, I'm going to pick up. You didn't finish your rhyme, I'm going to finish it for you. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a little bit about how the text can influence uh, both the circumstances, understanding the situation and how that might make the character move, also how an actor might 
inhabit the language to make it make the meaning more clear, um, and also how that might affect vocal choices as well. And just one more question, and then I'll open it up to yeah. more of the students. But what's your movement training, your movement background? How do you integrate movement with acting? Yeah, um, so all of the master fine arts actors here and, and many of the undergrads too study uh, contact improv, which is um, Professor Annie Louie in the theater department teaches this, this uh, technique, which is rooted in, in dance originally, but it's kind of based off of um, a little bit, almost mirroring, but not quite doing the same thing of somebody else, but letting your, letting your movement be influenced by the other person. And you, in, you integrate weight sharing, where you're taking people's weight, doing lifting. Um, but the idea is so that you are in recipro uh, reciprocity with the other actor. And then you add in scene work. And so you're doing a Shakespeare scene while you're on somebody's back, and then they lift you in the air. And you're, nobody's leading, nobody's and both people are following. Uh, but you learn a lot about your body and how to follow impulses and be in response to each other. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. Um, I also have some, some basic background in my past. Of, I've done some gymnastics. I've done some uh, modern dance. I've done uh, fencing. Um, so I've kind of have a little smattering of different things that have kind of contributed in some way, I'm sure. But, Excellent. Yeah. Okay, some questions from students. Yes. Can you just shout? <laughs> so, uh, as an actor, I'm curious, um, how did, because uh, I know you said you, you were like looking for conflict in the script rather than kind of looking at, you know, oh, like where's the repetition and, you know, some of the liter uh, literary devices. I'm curious, how did uh, kind of looking for those actor cues influence your understanding of the play from a literary yeah, well, I mean, I think they're totally intertwined. So when I say that I'm looking for conflict, that's the main thing I'm looking for, to be able to be actable so that I'm not just a walking paper. Um, that I need to, I, you know, I can understand that a play is saying something or has a theme, but that's not something I, as the character, can do. So I'm looking for what I can do, and what I can do is based off of my motivation, what I'm, what I'm trying to accomplish, and that comes from my understanding of the situation, all of the circumstances. And I think... Uh, in terms of my better understanding of the play, by, ask, by, by, you know, I kind of start every play, every script I ever look at, as looking at it like I am a, um, like a, like a detective, where I'm looking at what are the facts, what are the, what is the situation, and often we don't, I, at least in my experience, when I read Shakespeare before being an actor, I was just trying to understand the meaning, but instead, I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm trying to understand the meaning so I can uncover. What are the facts? What are the circumstances? What has happened? What's going on right now? What, it, what are the details? And then always there are major gaps, major holes, major questions that I'm like, well, this is the case and that's the case and I have to fill in this, this, this spot. And that's easy, I think, when we're just reading to you know, move on or if it's not related to the theme we're, we're studying, then we don't worry about it. But as an actor, I can't leave a gap. I can't, if I, maybe I don't have to know everything about the other plot lines if I never intersect with them. I'd like to, because I am interested in the play. But really, I, need, I cannot leave any holes about what I understand the situation to be and my motivations to be. So that will always make me dig deeper into the text. And that makes me have to know every word and the definition of what it means in that context based off this, the history. It has to uh, make me think about, well, why am I rhyming here? Why did I choose this word? Or what is the, what is the um, you know, why might I be using this literary device? and coming up with reasons. So it's, it's really, I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing something, I'm not ignoring those literary elements. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to justify them and why they may be there in a way that's maybe different than writing a paper. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lept. Professor Lupton uh, described uh, the different kinds of spaces where a midsummer is often performed and uh, students learned about the shape of the globe, but she also described what the new swans sort of setup is. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to perform in that space and with the kind of intimacy and the way that sort of works with the audience and how you thought about that in terms of this particular character. Totally. Um, yeah, so the new swan theater, uh, which you saw a little bit of, 
um, is basically it's based on a, a, the, Eliz the Elizabethan globe, the Shakespeare's globe, but it's much smaller. And so it's, it's almost in the round. It's almost, you've got people on almost all, all sides except for the, the, the full back of, of, the, of the theater and then multiple layers of people. The other thing about it is there's no roof and the walls are, um, what's the word? Sound can go through the walls. They're not, they're not solid. So as an actor, what that means is I've got people up here, I'm outside, there's no, there's no boundary. So right now I'm able to speak in a way that hopefully is reaching all of you in a pretty good way because we're in a, a, a building that care, is designed to carry my voice forward. And even if it wasn't designed perfectly for that, at least we've got bounds. We've got a ceiling, we've got walls, and the sound can bounce around and stay within this building. With, if you're outside and you're trying, to, if I'm trying to speak to all of you and there's no walls or no ceiling, it's going to be a lot more difficult for my voice to, to reach you because it's not being kept inside by the walls. So that's a, that's a major challenge of working outdoors. Um, but then there's also this, so, so in that sense, uh, and like Shakespeare performance I think necessitates, it needs to be full. You need to be able to articulate your language clearly, have a full vocal projection to be able to be heard by the audience. But at the same time, it's also very small. It's very intimate. So I have the audience pretty much from right here to about right here and around. So I'm always within a pretty close, even the people up here, they're, they're right here. They're right close to where I am. So I, I can't afford to be Oh, da, 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 very false and presentational. I have to have a little bit of reciprocity with the audience and actually be, I, I can see everybody. It's not out in the dark. I am talking, especially as Puck, speaking to the actual people. So what I love about working at the New Swan is it demands both seemingly opposite things that I think you need for Shakespeare. You need to be fully engaged and fully open and the circumstances are large um, which require uh, a bigger open performance. But at the same time, people are close, nearby, and it demands a certain amount of, of, although we're in a magical fairy kingdom and whatever, a certain amount of realism in the sense that I'm actually engaging with people in front of me. So I think that is a, it's a great challenge, and I think that the theater offers that challenge in a good way for performing Shakespeare. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, 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 there was um, a sort of gender play, gender switch up in Lysander becoming Lysandra. Uh, yes. I'm curious on how these elements of interpretation and the social context placed on the play also uh, might have affected your performance or uh, compelled you to make certain choices. Great question. Thank you. Um, I think the biggest one for me, because again, being the fairies weren't really costumed to be 50s, uh, besides maybe Oberon, but like, you know, you saw my costume, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm closer to like Billy Idol. <laughs> but I, um, so, so the 50s didn't have a huge impact on me because it felt like the fairies were kind of outside of time. But what did have a big impact about the choices that we made was looking at, at, at the gender element. So again, we had Lysander being Lysandra, and so the lovers were between Lysandra and, and Hermia. And, um, and so that kind, of, that kind of changed up that element, made me start thinking about uh, gender roles, gender expectations. And that, I think, highlighted for me the biggest, the biggest thing that it did for me is it really, really made me understand that first speech that I gave in a, in a way that I hadn't before about the changeling child. And I don't think, I might have missed that contrast between the knight, what, what Oberon wanting the changeling child to be, the knight versus having flowers. You know, that they, they had differing views of what this character is supposed to be. It's kind of paralleling uh, maybe the human's expectations of who you're supposed to love. Um, in this case, seeing uh, how these two different fairy or forces of nature, you know, maybe forces of masculinity, forces of femininity are trying to impose on this changeling child. And we also made a choice to, uh, to remove any gender markers from when referring to the changeling child. 
So there were, if, if you, you might have noticed that I never said he. Originally, it was all he. Uh, so they're all like one or the child or like I never refer to what the gender of the child is. And again, the child's costumed exactly like me. Um, so it kind of started to, 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 to bring out that a lot, that I'm noticing these competing ideas of them trying to impose something on this child, um, which, which led to another choice that we made that, hmm, well, maybe, maybe the changeling child is another version of Puck because a changeling is a, a child that was suspected to be kind of switched out by fairies. So that kind of sounds a little similar to the story that I found about Puck that was a half fairy, didn't realize he was a fairy, and then ran away. Um, so perhaps they're a similar type of, of being, and Oberon had raised me, and so now Titania wants to raise this other one. But what happens if I don't really want to be, you know, because we see Puck kind of being a little resistant to what he's supposed to do. He's do following his orders, but he's a little bucking the rules a little bit. So we ended up finding a place. It was one idea that I did have that I brought in was, what if when I'm doing the bottom transformation into the donkey, what if I bring on the, the changeling child? Because I was working with that actress, Kinsey Lon, about figuring, she was, you know, she didn't have any lines, but she was a significant force in the play, and figuring out, well, what's her arc? What's her storyline? What does she choose to do? And what if I offer her a third route of not having to pick either of these, you know, what both of these parents want, but what if I'm doing this thing about, hey, we can still play within the rules, but we can have our own personality or our own identity within it. So I ended up, as I'm doing the scene with, with Bottom, I go off and I bring, bring her on and kind of like show her what I'm doing as if maybe this is, maybe you don't have to, maybe not to pick. Maybe you can be with me and, you know, you can maybe fall into a category, but we can find our own play within the rules. I think that was the biggest, um, it started, to, th 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 those themes and highlighted by the director and by the production and costumes made certain elements of the play stand out to me more and then make certain choices from that. Thank you. Thank you. Any student questions? Angel, you have another question? How did you handle the relationships with other characters? Like you said that you saw yourself as Oberon's son, mm -hmm. but then for that to work, he also has to see you as his son and not just as lackey. So how did you like figure that out with other people? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think the, the great part about working in a theater is that you have several weeks of time, full-time rehearsals to work with the other actors. Um, so you can hash that kind of stuff out and kind of figure out, you know, agreeing upon certain things or if you don't agree, kind of having those sorts of conversations. Um, versus in film, you don't always have the time. You know, you get your script, you prepare, you come and for the most, time, mo for the most part, you kind of go through the scene one time and then you start filming. So it's, you don't have maybe those, those times, you kind of make your own decisions a little bit. Um, but uh, I think in terms of this, I know that I, I, I brought it up to Jesse who played Oberon um, and I think it definitely, it definitely came into play. It wasn't something that, that he had any kind of issue with. And I think it, it brought in a little bit more of a, of a context for what our, what our kind of closeness was. Uh, but at the same time, what's kind of cool about, about acting is I, I never, there's no lines about it in the, in the play. Or there's nothing that specifically has to do with that. So even if, and I'm not in Jesse's head, uh, but if, if for him, if he had heard that and said, nah, it doesn't really help me, he doesn't have to be thinking about that. If it helps me, there's no scene, there's nothing, nothing unless I'm doing something that really, really screws with his interpretation, we can, we can end up having different ideas about the gaps that aren't actually talked about in the play as long as it helps us buy in and, and believe ourselves in the roles. So... Um, I think it's always better if we all kind of agree on what the situation is, and we did. Um, but I, I, I'll say that even if, even if there is some di difference, um, it's, it's the actor's preparation to know what's motivated. It was helpful for me to think about that. And it didn't, whether or not he fully agreed or not, wasn't as important as the fact that our relationship was influenced by that. Having kind of this, you know, person who's directing me to do something and me kind of screwing with the rules, but still ultimately being on his side. So as long as those things are in place, I can think whatever I want. Yeah? Okay, I'm going to ask one more question, and then maybe people will want to chat with you for a few minutes sure. up, up front. Um, so our theme is animals. 
And um, there's a lot of animal imagery in Puck's speeches. Yes. So how did the animal imagery in the play, let's say I'm thinking about the wonderful speech um, during Bottom's transformation when you talk about becoming the headless, headless ba bear. bear and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about how you process that imagery physically as well as uh, in terms of tone and intention and all that? Yeah, um, so that's, and that also connects, um, there's a speech that, um, that, you know, again, as he's, the part that I was re-explaining about how I scared off all the rest of the rude mechanicals um, is that he turns into, you know, a, a horse, a, a dog, a headless bear, a fire, and kind of turns into things that are going to scare them. This is also, this also came up in the, the extra reading that I was doing about, um, you know, things that he could do. He could transform himself. Even in the first speech, he talks about, turning into a stool, and then, you know, he's gone and she falls, she falls down, the, the, the woman that he's referring to. So he's able to, being transformable is, I think, the biggest element of that. So during that speech, thinking about, well, it would be great if this was a movie that I'm, like, actually transforming into these different things. I can't do that, so what can I do in a short amount of time to change the shape of my body and, um, you know, the, 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 timbre of my voice or whatever I'm doing to kind of at least for a split second give you the feeling of oh I'm I'm this I'm this I'm whatever I am but I'm gonna dart between different shapes and sounds to at least give the uh, the feeling of transformation uh, and for me it's like really just finding the glee in that as well um, and the chase and um, yeah I think and I think that also knowing that beyond just that one speech or that one scene, knowing that that's one of his powers or one of his things he can do, uh, it, I think it, it, it gave me a sort of feeling with the rest of the play that turning on a dime was something that was in his wheelhouse. He's not, he's not a considerative, you know, I'm, le this, I'm leading from here, which takes me to this idea, and I'm moving through thoughts in a kind of systematic, careful sort of way, but because of his physical ability to transform, that kind of led to, I'm talking about this, which is over here, and then I'm going to turn over here, and that's, it's still influencing the way, even in smaller capacities, how I'm moving through the text, speaking-wise and physically. Well, fabulous. Thank you, Thomas Thank you.